Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want. Conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, vlogs, and all things spooky, scary, skeleton. So if you're into any of that, you can subscribe and if not, totally fine like no hard feelings i'm not gonna pressure you to subscribe or anything we're just here to kick back listen to some true crime grab your snacks grab your drinks whatever whatever floats your boat and today we are going to be talking about the clear lake murders so christina paula was born on march 31st 1986 in long island new york lived with her stay-at-home mother Lori, and her father charles when christine was two years old her father charles actually passed away in a construction accident. Since Christine was only two years old at the time, she couldn't really mourn or anything because she was still such a little baby. But as far as the mother, she grew into a very, very deep depression because of this. I mean, that was like the love of her life and even got into drugs as time went on. And then when Christine was five years old, that is when she was diagnosed with alopecia, a condition where you don't have any hair, eyebrows, or eyelashes. On top of having alopecia, she also had really bad vision that required her to wear very big glasses. Because of her big glasses and not having any hair, eyebrows, or eyelashes, she was bullied heavily at school. The kids would take off her wig and start running around with it. They would take off her glasses and make fun of her as she was trying to reach for them. And then the following year when she was six years old, that is when her mother started to get really, really bad with drugs to the point where the grand parents stepped in and decided to take care of her while the mother got back up on her feet again. Now when she moved in with her grandparents she was able to go to a different school but even though she was at a different school she still got bullied a lot for her alopecia and big glasses. She was also diagnosed with ADD so because of this she wasn't really performing well at school either which again made the school environment just 10 times harder for her. But eventually she just kind of got through it toughed it out and then when she was 15 unfortunately both of her grandparents had passed away now i'm not sure if they passed away at the same time or if one passed away and then because of the one passing away the other one passed away as well but either way her grandparents passed away when she was 15 had nowhere else to go so she got in contact with her mother again and her mother was actually doing 10 times better the mother had apparently went to rehab afterwards and cleaned up herself. She wasn't on any drugs or alcohol anymore and she was actually remarried with a house at this point. So because of the mom getting her life back on track, Christine really didn't have a problem with moving back in with her mom and her mom also didn't have a problem with Christine moving in. Something I should mention for later on is that when the father passed away, he actually had a $370,000 insurance policy, but the sole Sole beneficiary of this insurance policy was Christine but since she was only 15 at the time she wasn't able to access this until she was about 18. So then after she moved in the mother the stepfather and Christine decided to move from Long Island New York to Clear Lake City Texas. They felt like they just needed a fresh start. They wanted to buy a big enough house that Christine could live in and have her own room. That is when Christine went to Clear Lake High School and that is where she met two of her best friends Tiffany and Rachel. Tiffany Rawell was actually adopted by her mother and father Sally and Chester. Sally was a stay-at-home mom while Chester was a musician but when Tiffany was a very young age the two actually split and Chester quickly got remarried and so because of this she decided to stay with her mother. This ended up making the bond between Tiffany and her mother a lot stronger. Rachel, she had two sisters and a father, George, and her mother, Anne. Her household was very, very strict because the father sort of grew up in a military family and decided to bring those same ideologies and parenting skills to his own family. She was also very religious. She was in youth groups. She was camp counselors. But with Tiffany and Rachel, before they met Christine, they were 
were like the power couple. Everybody in the school knew them because they were super popular, but not only were they popular, they were very humble with it. They were kind of like popular in a way that everybody knew who they were, but they weren't mean or fake at all. They were super involved with like all the clubs and the sports and musical theater. They were very big on like school spirit. When the freshmen would come in for their freshman orientation, they were the first ones there to like bring up the vibes. They just had a good energy overall. And when they saw people bullying Christine for her alopecia or her big glasses, they decided to take Christine under their wing. Christine absolutely loved Rachel and Tiffany. She thought that they were the sweetest girls ever because as I said, she's been bullied all of her life. So the fact that like someone was actually paying attention to her and loving her, it was such a big deal. She told her mom all about it. She said, I met these two really sweet girls. They're gonna be like my best friend. They gave her contacts so she didn't have to wear her big glasses anymore. And then they taught her how to dress and how to do makeup. They would stay up in Christine's room where like reading those Tiger Beat magazines on like how to dress and stuff like that. Basically just gave her one of those early 2000s movie sort of makeover, you know, where like the nerd comes in and then they take off the glasses and they're like, whoa, she's so beautiful. She shows up to school a completely different person and a lot of people notice this as well because she used to be super quiet, keeping to herself, but a lot of people saw such a change in Christine, not in just the way that she looked, but also the way that she carried herself too. Christine was even elected as Miss Irresistible in her school's yearbook because, again, of just how much confidence she had gained through Rachel and Tiffany. These three girls ended up being best friends. Rachel and Tiffany invited Christine to a bunch of parties. Christine was out here making friends. This was a really big turning point for Christine's life because it was the first time, as I said, that nobody treated her badly or saw her just as like a laughing stock. In 2002, since Tiffany and Rachel are actually a year older than Christine, they graduated. But as far as Christine, she was still a junior and still had one more year left to go. Without Rachel or Tiffany there, it was kind of awkward for Christine because they were like her only friends in school. Christine basically just had to go out and make friends of her own. But by doing this, she ended up getting involved with the wrong crowd and falling into drugs. It was also around this time where unfortunately Tiffany, as I said, her father left her when she was a very, very young girl and it's always been her and her mother. Well, her mother actually ended up getting lung cancer, which was a big shock to everyone because the mother hadn't smoked a day in her life and it was really, really bad to the point where it started to spread very quickly and she ended up passing away when Tiffany Tiffany was only 19 years old. Now, since Tiffany was 19 years old, she was considered an adult. So what she decided to do instead of living with her father, she just decided to buy the house that they were living in and basically just live there with her boyfriend, Marcus. Her house later became like the hangout spot. Uh, a lot of people would go over there just to hang out, watch movies. She would throw a lot of parties there, but but Tiffany's rule at her parties is that she allowed no other drugs besides weed. Marcus had this cousin nicknamed D, and D and Marcus were basically like brothers. They would see each other as often as siblings. They would constantly hang out with each other. They were like best friends. Both of the boys were very respectful, very kind. They would always go on camping trips, and uh, D's sister said that D would literally pack as if he was going for a month, even though he was only going for a weekend. He loved, loved, loved fashion and music. Those were like his two passions. The type of person to do outfit changes during the day because he just loved fashion so much. And one of his dreams was to become a musician. So that is something that he was striving for and even got his diploma at 21 years old doing night school. He graduated and got his diploma so he could go to college for music or fashion. And it was also around this time where Rachel, instead of going straight straight into college, she actually decided to get a job first to save up for college. And so she got a job with Tiffany and they both worked as waitresses at this like bar and grill. The group, it was Tiffany, Rachel, Tiffany's boyfriend, Marcus, and Marcus's 
his cousin D. Now Christine would hang out with them sometimes but she was still in high school so she didn't really have as much free time as everyone else. As I said she was starting to fall into bad crowds and within these bad crowds she met a man named Chris Snyder. Chris Snyder at the time was 21 years old and he was known around town for not the best of things. He was known for being very violent, very into heavy drugs. He was also a drug dealer as well. When he was 12 years old, got hit by a car, which uh, made him have like this mood disorder. So he had very big anger issues. He would lash out quite frequently and Christine started to get involved with Chris. Now, since Chris was super into heavy drugs, he was actually the person that introduced Christine into heavy drugs. Right off the bat, when he introduced her to drugs, this relationship just became so, so toxic on both ends. Christine was very, very overprotective. She always had to know what he was doing all the time, always had to know where he was at, and frequently she would go and bang on the door of his family home and demand to see Chris. And if the parents wouldn't let her in, or if Chris just didn't want to see her, she would sleep out on the front lawn just to keep an eye on Chris. And this wasn't just all Christine. Chris was the same exact way. He was super, super protective of her. He would always manipulate her into doing various drugs. Whenever they were out with friends, he would always take off her wig as a joke, just like as a laughing stock, and also groomed her as well because he was 21 and at this time she was 16. Christine and Chris's family both felt like this was a very toxic relationship. They don't want their kids seeing each other anymore because even Tiffany and Rachel. So as I said, like Christine wouldn't really hang out with that group anymore. And it wasn't just because she was in high school, but it was because Tiffany and Rachel hated Chris because they knew that if they invited Christine, then Chris would come as well. They would tell off Chris all the time. Also tell Christine as well to break up with him, that she is way too good for him. But the couple basically just ignored everyone else's opinions and still stuck in this relationship. The families hated that they were in this relationship and they needed to do something to break them apart. One day, crazy and ironically, an anonymous caller calls the police on Chris saying that Chris is in possession of all of these insane drugs and you need to like arrest him. This ended up getting him locked up for a while. While he was locked up, the couple couldn't see each other anymore, which was actually really good for Christine because once she wasn't allowed to see Chris anymore, she quickly got back up on her feet again. Since there was no Chris, there was really no access to drugs anymore. So she ended up starting to go to treatments to to clean herself up like rehab as well as starting to get back in contact with Tiffany and Rachel again and started hanging out with them again. Once Chris was out of her life, Christine's life really started to, you know, pick up where it left off before she met Chris. Now, as I said, Rachel and Tiffany worked together at this bar. So when they were working together, the more that Rachel talked to Tiffany, the more she grew jealous of Tiffany because Tiffany had her whole house to herself. It was just her and her boyfriend. And she grew up in a very strict household where she wasn't really given much freedom or independence. So that is when one day she came home from work and basically told her family that she's moving out and she's moving in with Tiffany. Now, obviously her family was like, no, you're not. Since Rachel at this point was technically an adult, she was 19 years old. So the parents couldn't really do much about it. So even though her parents didn't really like the idea, she ended up moving out of the house house anyway and in with Tiffany. So now living in the house was Tiffany, Marcus, and Rachel. Early of 2003, that is when Chris, crazingly, had been released from prison. Since he was released from jail, he found Christine and Chris and Christine basically just picked up where they left off. They started being a very toxic couple together. Christine was so close. She was, you know, finally moving on with her life. She had just got done with her 
her treatment so she wasn't on drugs anymore. But then all of a sudden, Chris comes back in her life and screws it all up again. When she started hanging out with Chris, she unfortunately fell back into drugs and alcohol. Her parents describe this like second round to be very violent when it came to Christine. She would constantly get into fights with people. She was starting to build her criminal record. Uh, there was a lot of times where she would threaten her parents and there was at one time specifically that they actually called the cops because she had a knife to them threatening to stab them in their sleep if they didn't allow her to go see Chris. And there really wasn't anything for the parents to do because they knew that if they did anything such as tell her not to see him or even move away, there was going to be some way for Christine to still keep in contact with him or even run away with him. On Friday, July 18th of 2003, Tiffany was having a little party at her house like she typically does and she told everyone that the party started at around 6 p.m. 3 p.m. one of Tiffany's friends named Brittany, she called Tiffany. Tiffany wouldn't pick up. After calling her a couple times, she starts to get worried so she calls Tiffany's boyfriend Marcus. Now Marcus picks up the phone and he tells her that Tiffany is in the shower right now but he'll make sure to tell Tiffany when she gets out of the shower to call Brittany back. When Marcus gets off of the phone with Brittany, he calls D, his cousin, and asks him if he wants to hang out and go to Tiffany's like little get together party that night. D says yes, so Marcus drives over to D's house to pick him up. As D is leaving the house, D's big sister is sitting on the couch. As D was leaving, she basically told him to be safe and D replied with, I always am. The sister said that in this moment, she just had a really weird feeling and she didn't know what it was about, but she started to feel like a little worried and D saw that she was starting to get a little scared and D was like, don't worry, it's just a party, like we're gonna have fun. And then Marcus peeks his head out of the doorway and he's like, yeah, and I'm there too. I'll, I'll take care of him. D walks over to his sister, gives her a kiss on the forehead and a little hug and says, I love you, see you soon and walks out the door. And that would be the last time the sister has ever seen her brother. A couple hours go by and Brittany has not heard a single thing from Tiffany and it was around 6 p.m. Brittany calls her boyfriend and she's like, hey, Tiffany's having this party tonight, but she hasn't been replying to me or anything. I don't know if she's mad at me. Do you mind if we go over to her house? just to check up on everyone. Her boyfriend says, yeah, Brittany and her boyfriend get in the car and they go up to the house and Tiffany's car is in the driveway. So she knows that Tiffany's home. She looks through the window, she can't see anyone. And so she opens up the front door because the front door was unlocked. So walking into the house, Brittany actually walked first. And as she walked first into the living room, she came out of the house screaming and telling her boyfriend to call 911 because lying on the living room floor were the bodies of Tiffany, D, Marcus, and Rachel all shot to death. From the actual crime scene, there was a total of 40 shots, but from two different guns. Tiffany and Marcus were found lying on the couch with their feet propped up as if they were just watching TV while all of this happened, which told police that this was definitely a ambush sort of thing where the front door was unlocked. So they just came in and started shooting because if they really were like in a moment of distress, they would find the bodies lying on the floor because they were trying to run. But in this case, it just looked like they were shot while they were watching TV in their house. D though, D was in fact found on the floor, which told police that whoever did this shot Tiffany and Marcus first because they were sitting on the couch just close to one another. And D was found on the floor close to the couch, assuming that D was already sitting on the couch. But then once they heard the gunshots, he tried to run away. Rachel was the one that was found with the most shots. She was shot 12 times in 
all different areas, meaning that she was the last one. Rachel was found in the most heartbreaking of positions. She was found behind the couch and her phone was right next to her. And on her phone, it had dialed 911, but she unfortunately wasn't able to press call. They knew that this wasn't a robbery because from looking at the house, there was no forced entry as well as all of the jewelry and money was still there. Nothing was rummaged around either. The hardest part about this was trying to identify who could have done something like this. As I said, Dee's sister basically uh, told him goodbye. And then the very next day, she hadn't heard anything from him. And she just kind of assumed that like, oh, he was probably partying last night and this morning he's hungover. So he's not gonna, you know, wanna talk to me. She receives a call from Marcus's sister. So technically like her cousin, he said that Marcus and Dee were shot to death last night night. So that is how she found out. And when she did find out, she was actually alone because her whole family had gone on a fishing trip that morning. She had to be the one to tell her whole family what she had just heard. Uh, Rachel was also identified and her family was also made known of the situation. And what made it even worse is that the morning before all of this had happened, Rachel had actually called her family phone, but it went to voicemail because no one picked up. And she left the voicemail saying that she really missed everything everyone and she missed being home and she's thinking of moving back home and she really just wants to live with her sisters again. The father really took it the worst. The father was very, very close with the investigators. He was always, you know, on top of things. He was even going outside of what the like people were doing and doing his own investigations and leads. When Christine heard about this news, she was completely distraught. These were like her best friends. Friends. Christine's parents actually said that a couple days after the whole thing had happened, she slept in her parents' bed because she just couldn't stand the thought of, you know, falling asleep by herself. She grew very, very depressed, but this whole thing really made her realize life is very, very precious and she needs to clean herself up right now and get out of the toxic relationship that she's in so that she can live a fulfilling life. She broke it off with Chris. She no longer talk to Chris anymore. She went back into treatment. She started making new friends. She started, you know, thinking about going to college. Who could have done this? Because as I said, it wasn't a robbery because there was no forced entry and nothing was stolen. From all of the testimonies of all of the friends and family and even like people that went to school with the kids, no one said anything bad about them. Everyone said that they were the kindest, sweetest people ever. They weren't involved with like drugs or violence or they didn't, you know, cause problems at all. They we're just good kids living together. This crime was clearly passionate. It was clearly pointed at them because if there was nothing stolen, there must have been a more personal motive to this crime. Something that I do want to point out real quick that I thought was like very odd. When the police were investigating the crime scene, they couldn't again really figure out who could have done this and they weren't really getting anywhere as far as like leads and tips. So their main thing that they went with, a drug deal gone wrong. I was trying to find why the police thought this was a like drug deal gone wrong but I couldn't really find anything. Now this, I don't know, maybe I'm reaching, maybe I'm not. This is the 90s and three out of the four kids were people of color. And the bar and grill that Rachel and Tiffany had worked at together was a topless bar. And I just thought that it was really odd that the police, as soon as they saw this, they just assumed it was a drug deal gone wrong. When, as I said, these were good kids. Like they didn't have criminal records. They were all on really good paths. Tiffany had a very strict rule in her house that if you're gonna party here, don't bring any other drugs besides weed. D, he did drop out of school, but he actually earned his diploma recently to get his life back on track. Everyone who talked about the kids, every single testimony that they heard from people who knew them personally said that they were very sweet, very kind. They weren't troublemakers at all. They didn't do drugs. When they looked into the house, there was no drugs found in the house. Only two things that I found as to why the police must have thought that it was a drug deal gone wrong. There was like talk of Dee's uncle being in the Mexican mafia. 
don't really see how that's relevant because unless D was like his right hand man, why would someone do something like that? And then a second thing that I saw is that when people were calling into the police station with a bunch of tips, there was a couple tips that talked about when they went to parties, they would see weed. Police just kind of assume like, oh my God, the devil's lettuce. There, This must have been a drug deal gone wrong. Especially Rachel. Rachel was very religious. She was a youth camp counselor. It was just so wild to me to read because it's like, how did you get there? Like, how? And I'm mentioning this because they followed with this lead for the next two years. Two years is a very long time. And if they would have just changed their lead in motive, like just a little bit, they probably would have found the killer a lot quicker than when they did. Going back to the actual crime scene, they talked to a bunch of the neighbors to see if they heard any of the gunshots or if they saw anyone coming in, in and out of the house. And the next door neighbors had said that they had seen a man and a woman all dressed in black with their hoods up. They were looking in the windows of Tiffany's car. They were looking in the windows of the house, but the neighbors really just didn't think much of it. Maybe they're here for one of Tiffany's parties. I mean, they weren't like staring at them. Then the couple left and went out to lunch. And when they came back, that's when they saw a bunch of police officers and ambulances crowding the area. So they knew that something was wrong, which obviously like there's literally a bunch of police officers and ambulances and then it's like me and empath just sensing something is wrong this couple actually ended up giving the police um a sketch of what the people had looked like and they came up with a police sketch but they didn't release it to the public right away they actually just showed it to the families at first they never saw them in their life and since the families had never even seen those people before they again were just going on this drug deal gone wrong because they assumed that if it was no one that knew them personally then who else could have done this and they didn't even come close to a suspect until a whole three years later the police had received a call from an anonymous caller a man talking about how one night him and his friend were drinking and they got really really drunk his friend told him this story about how one time about about three years ago, him and his girlfriend were involved in a quadruple homicide. Obviously, the guy was very, like, scared, so he went to the police anonymously and he told them all of this, and as he was telling the story, there was a lot of details that this person told that wasn't available to the public, so when they asked him who this guy was, he said that his friend was named Chris Snyder. As the police set out to go and try to find Chris, this is unfortunately around the time where Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita had hit Texas. This slowed down the investigation a lot. The first priority was to go out there and help like victims of this hurricane, basically rebuild their entire town. Even the investigators themselves, they lost their homes and their families and so they needed to get themselves back on track. This case wasn't really the first thing on their mind. They basically just were trying to dedicate all of their time to rebuild the houses and the community. Although these hurricanes had hit, it really didn't slow down anything for Rachel's father. Rachel's father at this point had actually saved up enough money to have a $100,000 reward to anyone that came forward with any, you know, viable information. A year goes by and and everyone's kind of, you know, getting back in the swing of things. Now that they have a name, Chris Snyder, they're looking all over the place for Chris Snyder, but unfortunately they can't find Chris. They talk around to a couple of Chris's friends and they're like, oh, we haven't seen Chris in years. You'll probably find him through his girlfriend, Christine Paula. When the investigators heard of Christine Paula, they went back to the families and asked the families if they knew of a Chris Snyder, all of them 
said no. And then they asked them if they knew of a Christine Paola and Rachel's family specifically said yes, they knew of Christine because Christine was best friends with Tiffany and Rachel. It was actually made known after the fact that Rachel had a picture of Christine in her wallet and that was found at the crime scene as well. Family was like, no, but it can't be Christine. You definitely got the wrong girl. She would never do anything like this. But due to all of these testimonies pointing the finger at Christine, it was very hard to point it anywhere else. So the family was aware of Christine, but they truly did feel like they had the wrong person and that it could not be Christine because why would she do something like this? I just realized the light. That always happens to me. But nonetheless, this was a lead that they had to follow up on. So they tried to track down Christine and figure out where she was. When they went to Christine's family and talked to her mom and stepdad, they actually said that they hadn't seen Christine in a couple years because she had gotten married. As I said, she cut ties with Chris and she got back into rehab. When she was in rehab, she met this guy named Justin Rod. When Christine turned uh, 18, as I said, she had that 300 and $70,000 insurance policy. She basically took it and the couple bought a condo. Shortly after they got into the condo, he had proposed to her saying that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her and that she was so, so special to him and he loved her very, very much. And they eventually decided to, you know, get engaged. Then on March 22nd of 2005, about less than a year of knowing each other, that is actually when they decided to get married. As far as Justin's story, he dealt with a lot of abandonment issues. His mother left him when he was just two years old around the same time that Christine's father had passed away. Later on, Justin decided to join the military but actually failed a drug test and was immediately discharged afterwards. Since she had this insurance policy, instead of, you know, spending the money on more responsible things, they basically just took all of the money and spent it on drugs. Just both relapsed together. And they were spending all of their money on drugs to the point where they couldn't even afford their condo anymore. So instead they had to hotel hop to various hotels and just stay there for a couple of months at a time while spending $500 a day on drugs. When the $100,000 reward was known to the public, that is when the police decided to release the police sketch to the public, trying to get any public opinion. Like if you know who this person is, please call this number. It was actually the same night where Christine and Justin were in their hotel hotel watching the news and these police sketches came up on TV and immediately Christine started to freak out. She started telling Justin, does this look like me? Does this look like me? And Justin is like, oh my god, wait a minute. That actually does kind of look like you. And so Christine starts freaking out and Justin starts freaking out because he realizes that she was involved with a quadruple homicide that she he just like didn't know about. Because of this, they decided to get a hotel and Christine staked hideout in this hotel for about eight months, like did not go outside at all. Justin was the one that was constantly going out to go grab food and drugs and that was it. She didn't see the light of day for eight months from this hotel room. Police were trying to figure out where she was until on July 19th of 2006 she was staying at the La Cuenta in San Antonio, Texas and that is when they found her. They went into the hotel room that they were staying at and from the police testimony they say that it was probably the worst drug scene that they have ever seen. There was over a hundred needles found in the room. There was blood everywhere from like all of the needles. There was 56 pre, um, I don't know what that's called, like when there's pre-heroin in it. 56 of them like ready to go, ready to use for the day. There was rotten food everywhere, moldy food. It smelled terrible. There was like dog poop in there. But luckily for them, Justin and Christine were already sleeping in there. So they went in there. They took them to the police station for questioning. When being questioned, Question. Justin basically like he did not skip a beat. He walked in there and just told the police everything they wanted to know. He was like, yeah, Christine so many times has told me about like how she was involved in this quadruple homicide. But every time she started to talk about it, I would just cut her off and say, no, 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 no. Like, no, you didn't. 
no, we're, we're not gonna talk about that. But there was a few times where she did talk about it and those were the times that he told the police. But the police knew that he wasn't lying because he was talking about specific details that only like the person who did it would know. Oh yeah, I didn't mention this earlier, but basically when they were doing autopsies on all of the four kids, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dee's cause of death was through like bleeding to death of gunshots. But uh, Rachel's cause of death was blunt trauma force to the head. And a lot of like the investigators didn't really know what that meant. Justin explains the story as Christine and Chris were drug addicts and they really, really wanted drugs. And Christine had told Chris that sometimes they do weed at Tiffany's house. So they went over to Tiffany's house and immediately as they walked in the door, they just started shooting at everyone because the door was always unlocked. This would actually make sense because as I said, Marcus and Tiffany were just laying on the couch with their feet propped up. They weren't running around. They weren't on the floor. They were just shot where they were sitting. So that part does make sense. And then there was also a part where Justin had said that Christine told him that when Chris and Christine went outside because the job was done and they got all the weed that they needed, Christine went back inside because she had this feeling that like something was off. And when she went back inside, she saw that Rachel was dialing 911. So she hit Rachel on the head with her gun and walked out. Rachel's cause of death being blunt trauma force to the head was not something that was like in public newspapers, along with the fact that she was calling 911 was not public knowledge. Also her walking in and just shooting makes a lot of sense due to the placement of the bodies. As far as Christine's side of the story, Christine story the police didn't really believe because her story was just not lining up with anything. They noticed that the more she told her story, the more details started to change. There's one point in the story where she said that she never even went into the house, that she just stayed in the car the entire time. 20 minutes later, she would accidentally say a detail about the house and then the police would be like, how do you know that if you were never in the house? And then she would deflect and say, well, actually I went in there and the motive was just for drugs. So while he got the drugs, I had to hold everyone hostage. But again, that hostage situation just doesn't make sense due to the fact that Tiffany and her boyfriend Marcus were just lying on the couch with their feet propped up, very, very relaxed. There was no defensive wounds on any of the victims either. The police just call her out and say, we know you're lying because your husband is out there literally like ratting you out. And his story seems a lot more believable. There is no way that what you're saying could have happened with all of these crime scene photos we have of the actual day and how everything went down. The investigators were like, okay, well, if you say that your husband is lying, why is he lying then? It, does he have something to do with it? And as soon as the investigators ask her that, she deflects that and quickly goes to, oh, I'm withdrawing from my drugs. I need to go to the hospital. So they take her to the hospital to basically fuel her up again. And the next day with a more clear mind, she tells the police that it was actually not her fault and it was all Chris's fault. Chris was the ringleader. He's the one who wanted the drugs. He's the one who forced her into this. And she says that after Chris got all of the drugs, she was just planning on letting the four go. But Chris took his gun and started shooting at everyone. And then he went over and put his hand on Christine's gun and started shooting the gun for her. So technically she didn't shoot anyone. It was all Chris that was doing it for her, which is ridiculous. Like that makes no sense. It made no sense with the way that the crime scene was set up. The blood splatter patterns on the wall and the floor just did not make sense with the story that she was saying. Husband Justin kept to one story and that story lined up perfectly. It was just really pointing at Justin was telling the truth and Christine was avoiding it. So I know what you're thinking. Where is Chris? So they go on the hunt for Chris. They go to his family home. And when they ask for Chris, the mother and his sister actually say that they hadn't seen Chris in a couple years actually. But if you did want to find him, you'd probably find him at his girlfriend's house. Now, when the police left to go to his girlfriend's house, the mom and the sister actually called him and said, hey, Chris, the police are here. They're looking for you. They're talking about a quadruple homicide. So he 
left his girlfriend's house and fled to South Carolina and he was found about two weeks later in the middle of a woods because he had killed himself. Since he had killed himself, uh, Christine was the only one who was going down for this crime. It was only her story, only her words. It gave her more motive to blame everything on Chris and say all these wild accusations about Chris. He was dead so he wasn't able to defend himself or say his side of the story. And on August 5th of 2008, that is when Christine's sentencing had began and she was found guilty for the four counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole in 40 years. In 2046, she will be eligible for parole. They were trying to get her the death penalty actually. There was apparently a law back then in Texas that you weren't allowed to be given the death penalty if you were a minor. And at the time of the crime, uh, Christine was 17 years old. So they were trying to give her the death penalty, but since she was only 17 during the crime, technically they couldn't do that. So instead they just settled for life in prison. As far as the families now, they are still coping with everything. Rachel's father uh, started an organization and leave it down below. Basically it's an organization that helps with grieving parents of children who had just been murdered or are like missing services such as like guidance and money and support and like a uh, group therapy sessions. As far as the other families, they are coping as well. There's not really much about where they're at now because most of them just kind of wanted to keep a low profile since then. That's basically um, today's video. If you found this interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I don't really have any opinions on it really. I mean, I've said it all already. I went for a very different look today. This is something that I've never done. I got inspired by, what's her name? Hannah, I believe. I don't know if I like it. I don't think I can rock lashes like how I want to rock lashes. I also went with dangling earrings because I thought that'd be cute. So with that being said, do something that makes you happy today.